Let me welcome you all to the 15th installment of the O.P. Jindal Distinguished Lectures. Um, this is the eighth here and the 15th installment. Um, I'm Ashutosh Varshne, um, Director of the Center for Contemporary South Asia. Um, and uh, professor here at the Watson Institute and the Department of Political Science. Uh, let me start with a word about the genesis of these lectures. Sajjan and S Sangeeta Jindal, I hope I'm audible or, yeah. Um, Sajjan and Sangeeta Jindal, Brown Parents 20, 2012, have endowed these lectures in perpetuity in memory of O.P. Jindal, Sajjan's deceased father. The purpose of the endowment is to promote a discussion of the politics, economics, society, and culture of modern India here at Brown. These lectures are held once every semester. The previous lecturers include Kaushik Basu, who, among other things, served as the chief economist of the World Bank, Ram Guha, a historian, Ashish Nandi, a political psychologist, William Dalrymple, um, a literary figure and founder of the Jaipur Literary Festival, Amitav Ghosh, a novelist, Monte Kahluwalia, uh, an economic policymaker, um, um, and Pratap Mehta, uh, a political philosopher and until recently the vice chancellor of Ashoka University, and several others. <clears throat> Today's Jindal lecturer is Raghuram Rajan, who is the Catherine Dusak. Miller, Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago at the Booth School of Business. <clears throat> he was the 23rd Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, which is India's Fed, between uh, September 2013 and September 2016, for three years. And before that, he was also, among other things, um, for three years, the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Uh, Raghu, as we call him, his research interests are in banking, corporate finance, and economic development, especially the role that finance plays in development. His books include The Third Pillar, How the State and Markets are leaving communities behind, published earlier this year. I Do What I Do on Reform, Rhetoric, and Resolve, published in 2017. And the very well-known Fault Lines, How Hidden Fractures Still Threaten the World Economy, for which he was awarded the Financial Times Goldman Sachs Prize for the Best, book, best Business Book in 2010. Raghu was the president of American Finance Association in 2011. And in January uh, 2003, the American Finance Association also awarded him the inaugural Fisher Black Prize for the finance researcher under the age of 40, for the best finance researcher under the age of 40. The other awards include the Infosys Prize in the Economic Sciences in 2012, the Deutsche Bank Prize for Financial Economics in 2013, and uh, just I would uh, note one more, among others, the Euro Money Central Banker Governor of the Year, Central Bank Governor of the Year Award in 2014. In this first of the two lectures, Raghu will speak to us for 45, 50, 55 minutes on India's economy. How did we get here and what can be done? That's the title. Um, I might add, it's an important uh, addition, that um, this is uh, Raghu's first full length public lecture on India's economic policy since leaving office in September 2016. First, first public, le full length lecture. He has given statements on on economic policy, but this is the first lecture, and we are, of course, very proud that this lecture is being given at the at our center at Brown at Watson Institute. <clears throat> I will introduce the discussant, Arvind Subramanian, later uh, after 
Raghu's lecture is over. So please welcome Raghu Ram Rajan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great privilege to be asked to deliver this lecture, especially given the illustrious names uh, who have preceded me here. And uh, um, I thank the Jindals for endowing this, uh, this lectureship. So what I want to talk about today is, uh, is really where we are in the Indian economy. By the way, I've got you under false pretext. I'm only going to talk about how we got here. Uh, what we do about it is for the next lecture, which is on Friday. So, so let, uh, let me talk a little bit about where we are. Um, and let me start by saying we are in a very worrisome place in India today. Uh, growth has slowed considerably. Uh, the fiscal deficit is large, uh, leaving little room to do something about that growth. And uh, there's rising debt levels in many areas in the Indian economy, uh, some of that distressed. So India is an economy which, uh, you know, for 25 years has been growing at 7%. But uh, what we see today is much slower growth. And if we are to believe Arvind Subramanian's work, I'll talk a little bit about it later, perhaps even lower than the headline numbers that we see. So um, what I want to talk about is how we got here. Why are we here? What are the things that we've done wrong along the way, uh, both sins of commission as well as things of omission, things we didn't do, and uh, that have brought us to this pass. Um, so um, I want to focus on uh, the next few slides, talk a little bit about growth, talk a little bit about the fiscal, and talk a little bit about debt and distress, just to give you a sense of where we are, and then spend a lot more time on trying to analyze the roots of the problem which then will help us think a little bit about what can be done to rectify it. Okay? So the first is to show you that, in fact, we have been slowing. Uh, again, this is not taking into account some of Arvind's concerns. Um, we were growing really fast before the Great Recession. And then 2009 was a year of very poor growth. We started climbing a little bit about it uh, after it. But uh, since then, since about 2012, we've had a steady upward movement in growth, going back to the pre-2000 uh, uh, pre-financial crisis growth rates. And then, since about uh, early, uh, since about mid 2016, we've seen a steady deceleration. Uh, and now the latest numbers were 5% um, for the last quarter. But when you look at some of the investment bank projections for the next quarter, uh, they're not very happy. It doesn't look like there's going to be a rebound in the very short run. Now, um, some of the reasons for this, uh, uh, the first two uh, series are uh, the fiscal year 2005 to 2011 uh, sources of growth. Um, this has a pointer, right? The pointer is this. That's uh, 2005 to 2011. The old series is under the new series. Which, um, the one thing that hits you between these two sets, I just put them up because this, okay, so let's let's focus on the middle. What hits you is rest. Consumption is about level. So the first point that one has to make is investment has been falling steadily in the Indian economy um, ever since uh, probably the global financial crisis. Uh, but it's been falling steadily, uh, actually, from a few years after that. Consumption has been relatively uh, strong and holding up across these two periods, but more recently, consumption has also been falling. Um, net exports 
were never a strong source of additional growth. So um, again, continuing on the same theme, what you see most recently is consumption is falling rapidly. If you look at every element of the auto industry, look at cars, look at commercial vehicles, look at uh, two-wheelers. Two-wheelers are a good uh, proxy for rural uh, demand. Um, commercial vehicles are a good proxy for industrial demand. And of course, cars are a good proxy for urban uh, demand. And you see all of them tanking, tanking to the extent of 30, 40 percent uh, uh, levels of negative growth. Okay? Now, some of this is because of uh, policy changes that came in, for example, changes in emission requirements. Some of it is because of uncertainty about whether the uh, value-added tax will be changed for these. So if I think the value-added tax is going to come down from 28% for cars, I might say I'll wait and see before buying a car because it does make a lot of difference in the price of a car. But a lot of it is because of a, um, a uh, shortfall in credit availability to households as well as households themselves postponing consumption. Um, and finally, uh, when you look at the uh, trade balance, what you see is that in the years of strong growth, um, India's exports were growing, in fact, growing faster than GDP, so that exports rose as a share of GDP. Over the last so many years, they have been uh, growing slower than GDP growth and therefore falling as a fraction of GDP. And this is true when you even take out oil. That's the numbers on the right-hand side are non-oil exports, and you see that that has been falling. So India's investments have been falling, India's consumption is falling, and India's exports are not doing as well as they did in the past when they were growing really strongly, especially in the years of strong growth, when India became a much more open economy by the usual measures. Uh, today, it's in, in, in some sense, closing down relative to the past. Now, I said, on the one hand, uh, growth has been relatively slow, but the fiscal is also a, a source for concern. India's fiscal deficit to GDP uh, is officially 7%. That's the sum of the state government's fiscal deficit and the central government's fiscal deficit is about 7%, has been flat around that the last few years. But the reality is this fiscal deficit conceals a lot. The headline numbers, again, conceal a lot. Um, if you look at the projections for the coming year, the revenue projections are very optimistic uh, uh, by most counts. And we just had a corporate tax cut, which you know estimates of its cost vary, but that's going to add to the burden of the fiscal deficit. What is less noted uh, but something that the uh, Auditor General has pointed out in India is there's a lot of borrowing which is going off balance sheet and which is not being counted in the fiscal deficit. For example, the Food Corporation of India is essentially a department of the government. The Food Corporation's borrowing should be thought of as part of the, of the fiscal deficit, but is off balance sheet. And you can see that skyrocketing uh, over the last couple of years from about 0.7% of GDP to 1.1%. So 0.4 percentage points of GDP are buried in Food Corporation of India borrowing. And similarly, the National Highway Authority of India, that's the uh, chart on the right-hand side, you see borrowing there go up from 0.2% of GDP to 0.7% of GDP, another 0.5 percentage points of GDP. In other words, add these two, you get one percentage point of GDP. That is not counted in the fiscal deficit, but it's actually part of the fiscal deficit. Add to that a whole variety of normal shenanigans that the finance ministry does. I was in the finance ministry, so I know exactly what we do. Uh, we push, uh, we accelerate any revenues we can find and push any payments we have to make. Well, at some point, that catches up with you. Uh, and, and so put all these together, add to them the fact that we have rising contingent liabilities in India, uh, 
the rising non-performing assets means that banks need recapitalization. Some has been done, but uh, going forward, there is a question of how much more is needed. You're seeing the non-bank financial companies, so I'll come to that in a, some, in a little bit of time, uh, they are in trouble, and they may need some uh, state support. You've got rising healthcare commitments. We have a whole new healthcare program, Ayushman Bharat, which is being rolled out. As it rolls out, it will require more resources. So these are all contingent liabilities. We don't account for them well in the budget, but they hit uh, future budgets. And so contingent liabilities are rising, which leads um, you know, respectable investment banks like JP Morgan to put the, the actual uh, fiscal deficit as somewhere between 9 and 10% of GDP. That's a large number. It's especially large in India because we've brought inflation down. In the past, when inflation was available as the inflation tax, you could inflate away your debt. And that helped make your finances look a lot healthier. Today, with inflation so low, it's much harder to do that. You actually cannot inflate away your debt that easily. And therefore, that's a source of concern. Our fiscal is tighter than similar numbers would be in the past. Now, let me go on to debt and distress. One of the worrying things about the recent environment is household savings are falling. So households are saving less. Now, Indian households are natural savers. And the fact that they're saving less should be one source of concern. Why aren't they saving more? Because, after all, Asian economies grew on the basis of strong savings invested uh, uh, well. So savings are falling over the last few years. But increasingly, you're seeing that also reflected in higher debt levels. Household debt levels are increasing by about 10, uh, by, you know, 9 to 10 percentage points of GDP over the last four or five years. So households are borrowing much more, saving less. That's not a good combination. That means that, well, they, they did not have a whole lot of debt earlier, so they started from a low base, but they uh, borrowing quite rapidly, and that has to be an additional source of concern. And you can see emerging signs of distress. For example, on the corporate side, um, what we see is if you look at credit rating companies, credit rating companies will give you ratios of the number of credit upgrades to credit downgrades. And so the lower this number is, the more stressed your corporate sector is. And this stress is now at a six-year, uh, uh, this level of stress is at a six-year high. In other words, the upgrades to downgrades ratio is at a six-year low. We're as bad as we were, uh, you know, at that point where we, we were starting to grow again. So stress is piling up in the system, uh, probably as a result of low demand, slow earnings growth, and difficulties in serving, servicing debt. So uh, I've talked to you about what, what we see today and why we should be worried. Let me talk a little bit about what the roots of the problem are. And I want to argue broadly that um, we've really had no significant uh, uh, continued reforms in India to propel economic growth since 2004. Now, what is that year? That is the year the last uh, um, uh, BJP government, the NDA won under Atal Bihari Vajpayee. That's when it, it lost uh, the election. We had first a reforming Congress government in the early 90s, followed by a number of coalitions, followed by the BJP government. That 15-year period, uh, or 14-year you know, period from the early 1990s to 2004, was a period of significant reforms, where we cut down our tariffs, became a more open economy, uh, and even did some privatizations under the Vajpayee government. That was also a period where growth was not that strong. But it created the environment for really strong growth. The problem with the Vajpayee government was that even by the end of its term, we still hadn't got to the spectacular growth we saw in the next three or four years afterwards. 
uh, at least the experience of growth amongst the broader uh, people was not that strong. And so Vaj the Vajpayee government's campaign for re-election in 2004, which was based on India rising, simply didn't catch hold. And um, they, uh, they lost narrowly uh, to the Congress. Congress came in with a coalition government which had the communists in it and uh, really could not continue the reforms that the NDA had started because simply there wasn't that much consensus within the coalition partners. Nevertheless, there was an explosion in investment. And what you can see here is the rise in new projects announced as uh, we go into three, four, five, uh, just before the financial crisis, you have a substantial explosion in projects announced, strong growth, and many of these projects were completed on time. Uh, power plants, many power plants completed, uh, road building projects uh, completed, the golden quadrilateral in India was, was, uh, was done in, uh, during the Vajpayee regime. So there was strong um, infrastructure investment, strong growth. Now, the collateral effect of that strong growth was it put a lot of pressure on resource allocation, including the institutions to allocate those resources. So a lot more need for land, a lot more need for iron ore, a lot more need for coal, a lot more need for spectrum. All these pressures rising at the same time as demand for these across the world is rising. Iron ore, for example, strong demand in China. The prices of these things are going through the roof but we don't have strong systems for allocation because they were never that, that, that valuable. And so, uh, you know, iron ore was, uh, we, we really had no system to allocate it. First come, first serve, take it. Um, but as they grew more valuable, the old systems of allocation simply didn't work anymore. And we needed more formal structure. But we didn't put those formal structures in place. We still had the old informal arrangements, and that became the source of tremendous amounts of corruption. So one of the consequences of the strong growth was a series of corruption scandals which came to light in UPA too, the second term of the U UPA government. Now UPA, the Congress-led United, uh, United what front? Uh, Progressive Alliance uh, got um, uh, what it thought was a boost at the end of its first term to a massive farm loan waiver. My suspicion, as well as uh, of some uh, analysis, is that really the boost came from the strong growth they experienced through much of that, that, their tenure. But the, the belief was these populist measures were an important factor in their re-election. And so when UPA2 came into power, one, further reforms was stymied, despite their ability to do further reforms, uh, by the fact that they really believed uh, it was not from growth, but from these populist policies that they had gotten reelected, and the emphasis was much more on populist policies in UPA 2. Net effect was right through UPA 1 and UPA 2, there were relatively few of the growth enhancing liberalizing reforms, especially because in UPA 2, even the reforms they wanted to do, like the goods and services tax, was stymied by op the opposition um, protests, which grew louder and louder as some of these uh, corruption scandals came, came, uh, came, uh, um, came to light. So UPA2 was essentially a period where we didn't have significant uh, uh, growth enhancing reforms. We had a lot more spending, especially on, uh, on, on distributive stuff, such as the um, uh, the, the Food Act, uh, the Food Security Bill, um, and um, inflation uh, started going through the roof. Inflation started going through the roof in part because of strong demand, but in part also because we saw increasing supply bottlenecks being created in the economy. Uh, for example, because land acquisition got much harder, many of the bureaucrats, because of these corruption stand scandals, became much, much less willing uh, to, to put out for fear that they would be um, sort of held up by, um, by investigative authorities. The bankers, um, who were really quite willing to lend in the phase when, uh, before the financial crisis when projects were doing really well, 
uh, now became a little more risk averse. Uh, also for fear that if loan went bad, they get hauled up by the investigative authorities. So essentially, the economy started slowing down considerably uh, post-financial crisis, but also it had high levels of inflation. So macro stability was a great concern at this time. And uh, India had basically all the bads, high levels of inflation, uh, high fiscal deficits, um, and, uh, and uh, not so strong growth. Uh, at which point, there was a course correction in the Congress government. Uh, it started the process of fiscal consolidation. Mr. Chidambaram came back to the finance ministry uh, to focus on that. And uh, we had done a little bit when we were faced with the taper tantrum. Uh, those of you who remember that time, essentially Ben Bernanke said that he was going to end the process of quantitative easing in the US. And that immediately set off a uh, real um, bout of volatility in financial markets. Capital started flowing out of a number of emerging markets. And emerging markets that didn't have good macro numbers, amongst which uh, there was India, uh, were thought of as prime candidates for money to leave. India was one of the fragile five at that time, and we lost capital very quickly. So that was a wake-up call. And the government listened at that time and transformed uh, to focus much more on macro stability, bring the fiscal deficit down, try and enhance growth, try and do whatever reforms were possible. And uh, at that time, uh, I think the RBI also joined in in trying to bring down inflation in to making that a focus. Move forward from the UPA2 to uh, Modi 1. Uh, I'll call it Modi 1 just to distinguish it from ND NDA. Um, it came in on the basis that the old government was relatively corrupt. It was going to be much cleaner. It was going to create jobs. It was going to create, run a transparent government. And of course, there were the traditional BGP, BJP elements like uh, Kashmir Uniform Commercial Code, sorry, Uniform Civil Code, and, uh, and uh, Mandir that they wanted to make. But that was all uh, on the side. The central issues were jobs and lower corruption. And as it came in, it started implementing some important reforms uh, on the macro side, on the sectoral side, and to some extent on the uh, household and populist side. Uh, I want to show you this as the fact that uh, during UPA2, investment started plummeting and stayed low, has stayed low really uh, since then. Um, um, this is uh, the other platform that, uh, um, uh, the other attempt at macro stability, which was to bring inflation down, that has been a success. We have brought inflation down in India from the double digit levels that were there. Uh, um, but but uh, what I want to emphasize is that um, in this uh, period, uh, we had um, the advent of uh, uh, Modi's, uh, 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 Prime Minister Modi's government. And it started going about macro, sectoral, and household-focused reforms. Unfortunately, uh, it has been a mixed bag. It has been a mixed bag uh, because, uh, on the one hand, as I just showed, we haven't been able to revive investment. Uh, we haven't brought investment back. Uh, a lot of the promoters who started projects in the past are now highly stressed with high levels of debt. They simply cannot start new projects, and banks are anyway not interested in lending to them. Even old projects, if you look at the projects that are stalled, they have also been increasing and haven't been brought down significantly. The reason they're stalled is because promoters have lost interest. Now, uh, one of the successes uh, of both the old uh, UPA government as well as the NDA government was essentially giving uh, the RPI free hand to bring down inflation. That has been a success. Inflation is low, uh, for um, you know, and has stayed low for a considerable period of time. The RBI also undertook a series of reforms. For example, opening up branching, licensing, uh, improving retail electronic payments. We now have a state-of-the-art payment system uh, for retail payments called the Universal Payment Interface, which uh, actually is better than many places in the world. 
Uh, these were all uh, uh, small level reforms. But one of the big concerns that was there was that as projects uh, sort of initiated fell, there were also a whole lot of old projects which were stored and getting into distress. Bad loans started building up in bank balance sheets. And, and that's what you see here. That is, um, the um, NPAs of public sector banks started rising. Now, the problem with uh, banks when they start seeing bad loans is there's a temptation to hide them, to push them under the carpet, especially if the bank CEO has a short horizon. I'm going to be gone in two years. Why do I have to recognize all the bad loans now? They're going to hit my profitability. Why not bury them for the next two years? The next guy can deal with them, right? So evergreening is a constant feature in banking systems across the world. And you really have to force the banks to recognize the bad stuff. Because until they recognize it, they don't do anything about it. And so good money gets thrown after bad in keeping these projects afloat, even though they simply need to be restructured if they have to have any hope. So what happened here uh, in uh, Um, the RBI undertook an exercise to clean up the banks and essentially forced them to start recognizing their bad loans. And what happened as a result, this was the asset quality review undertaken by the RBI, is the NPAs of the banks shot up because there's a lot of stuff they had been burying, which came to light at that point. Now, what the classic way of dealing with this is force them to recognize, force them to start dealing with these loans and working them out with the promoters so that they can be put on track. In the meantime, recapitalize the banks so that they have enough capital to make new loans where lending is necessary. Now, bank recapitalization has been halting. The government has done some, but uh, typically been a little behind the curve. What the government did, which was very important, was pass the um, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act. Now, one of the problems in India in the past, as uh, some of you in India know, is that it's very hard for a lender to recover money from a borrower because there's no way of essentially forcing the borrower to pay up. We had a bunch of acts passed, but every time we had an act passed, uh, it worked initially. For example, what was called surface, an attempt to uh, give uh, lenders the right to seize collateral. But after a little while, the promoters figured out how to stymie the lenders once again. Uh, Surface got clogged up in the courts. The debt recovery tribunals got clogged up in the courts. And so the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act was yet another attempt to try and force the borrower to repay their lenders and not have the lenders go from pillar to post in trying to look for their money. And initially, it has worked. Initially, it worked in putting the fear of God in borrowers and forcing them to repay. More recently, however, it seems as if it's going the way of the old acts. The promoters have figured out how to end run the banks. And the judiciary has also intervened in a way as to make it longer and longer and costlier and costlier. And so, Unless we do something about the insolvency and bankruptcy code, it will go the same way as the older reforms. It will be essentially gamed to ineffectiveness. Um, the, uh, what also has happened in India in the financial sector is that we've had the public sector banks getting into trouble. Because they got into trouble, their lending started slowing down significantly. is that the public sector banks, that's the uh, blue line, were lending a lot uh, post-financial crisis. And then as uh, their loans started getting into trouble, started reducing their lending. Now, 2014 15 is important. Uh, 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 what here is public sector banks lending is 
put by private sector. What is this team as a bad piling up? They were stopped. And so in order to get them lending again, we needed to force them to rent the debt. Then they would start lending again, and that's exactly that comes going. Now, what's happening at the same time also is that the non-bank financial non-bank that's way like are also lending uh, several so in recent years, the public sector banks have started lending much less. The private banks and non-bank financial companies have lent much more. Now, the private banks have been relatively careful about their loans. A lot of their loans are retail loans. The non-bank financial companies were also generally careful about retail loans. But one uh, source of lending was a lot more pro has been a lot more problematic for them, which is they lent to developers who built out some of these projects. And those developers have gotten into trouble uh, because of the slowdown in the retail sector. And as a result, the non-bank financial companies also had incipient loan losses on their balance sheet. But this came to a head when a big non-bank financial company, ILFS, essentially imploded in September 2018. And as a result of that, non-bank financial companies found it hard to get credit a lot of them have gotten into deep trouble since because not only do they have little access to credit, but they have loans building up on their asset side, which are going uh, from bad to worse. So this is broadly legacy problems piling up. We're not able to clean up the projects that are stuck. We're not clean, able to clean up the banks fully, but that process is underway. Non-bank financial companies have filled the breach, but are also starting to get into a little bit of trouble. Now, two big actions also happen over this time, which create significantly more problems for the system. The first is, out of the blue, India demonetized 87.5% of the currency. Now, uh, essentially what happened was the government said 500 rupee notes and 1,000 rupee notes are no longer current. And what happens when you demonetize 87.5% of the currency? Basically, people don't have currency to do transactions with. Some of it was replaced, but it was replaced slowly. It took three, four months to replace it entirely. In that period, the informal sector basically didn't have money to do, do its transactions with. These are people who don't use credit cards, don't have checks, and essentially um, a whole lot of them got into trouble. Um, it's hard to measure the damage that was done to the informal sector because we really don't collect statistics on them. But the anecdotal evidence is a lot of people went out of business. And there's some actual studies which show it now that especially in rural areas, there's a lot more uh, fall in transactions done as a result of the demonetization. But in addition, there are sectors which deal primarily in cash for a large part of the transaction or some significant part of the transaction. Real estate is one sector that is especially focused on cash. And this sector was already, as I said, weakening. But with demonetization, it got into further and further trouble. Uh, and that also then spilled over to the developers who had built this real estate and then further to the non-bank finance companies. So that was blow number one. And measures of how much the setback growth uh, vary from 2-3% of GDP for a, few, uh, for a couple of quarters to 2-3% of GDP on an annual basis. Now, this is all using stuff we can measure. What is harder is to think about the stuff we can't measure. Uh, certainly, if you look at employment numbers, for example, put by, out by the CMIE, unemployment went up significantly post-demonetization. The second big blow was the goods and services tax. Now, demonetization was introduced without substantial preparation. I say substantial because we know there wasn't enough currency printed to replace the currency that was taken out. You had to print at full speed for the next four months. Typically, you don't do such things. 
you typically, when you demonetize, have the money ready to roll out on the day you demonetize. That was not done, suggesting the timing was chosen for other reasons than everybody was fully prepared. That leads to the next issue, which is we had the rollout of the goods and services tax. This is a wonderful concept. Demonetization was misguided in concept. It was not uh, a thing which either affected its aims, which was to bring down black money, or um, you know, affected what became a later aim, which substantially increased the level of electronic payments or substantially formalize the economy. What it did was create a lot of pain in a very short period of time, especially for the poorer informal segments of the economy. It was brilliant politically, though, because um, you know, the uh, government won the UP election uh, soon after demonetization. So it was, it was sold politically very well, but it was not an economically well thought out idea. The goods and services tax was the next big reform, and it is something that the UPA government has been pushing, hadn't gone through because the BJP had opposed it then. The BJP took it on and, to its credit, managed to push it through as a constitutional amendment. It was a sound concept, uh, but again initiated without enough preparation. Um, the computers weren't ready for the volume of transactions, which means right off the bat, you had to say, don't do this, don't do that. OK, we're going to simplify the forms. There's a lot of back and forth, uh, which essentially undercut compliance. And the constant fiddling with the rates, I would presume, also created uncertainty. One could argue that some of the recent fall in demand for cars, for example, is because people are still trying to figure out, are they going to reduce the uh, tax, uh, the goods and services tax on this from 28% in order to enhance demand? If so, I don't want to buy now. I want to wait till they reduce it. So this fiddling back and forth creates uncertainty, which eventually has effects on, on growth. And so uh, ideally, you would want everything to be planned out, everything to be rolled out. Nothing in life actually happens that way. You have to roll it out to see some of the problems. But arguably, the goods and services tax had thought less about what would happen than one would want in such a big reform. One could even argue with the benefit of hindsight that one should have run a parallel experiment to see if it worked before running it out on such a massive scale across India. Uh, you could uh, say that you, know, you never experienced the full volume that would, you would experience running it out all over India. Nevertheless, it was an experiment that uh, should have been better planned uh, in, in, in hindsight. It has been costly. Um, so let me quickly walk through uh, some of the um, sectoral reforms. Uh, agriculture, there has been, uh, again, some reform. Uh, crop insurance has been broadened. There's been uh, uh, a significant increase in the rollout of uh, direct benefits for fertilizers rather than subsidizing them, et cetera. But the reality is, despite some of these changes, Agriculture is still a big problem for India. Too much of the population still depends on it, and productivity has been abysmally low. Even though India has had some successes uh, in food and agriculture, for example, we're the largest milk producing country in the world. Nobody knows this. Uh, I mean, few people know this, but we are, and we have done it on the back of a substantial revolution in milk production. Um, and similarly, yields in a variety of crops have been increasing, but not to the extent desirable. And this has been compounded in recent years by the fall in the agricultural terms of trade. That is, the prices that are obtained by farmers have, in fact, uh, not kept up and have fallen relative, for example, to the cost of their inputs. And so there's deep agricultural stress. And the way governments across India deal with this is periodically waiving off uh, agricultural loans. The problem there is that the poorest farmers don't get loans. They go to the money lender. So the beneficiary of loan waivers typically are the richer farmers, and it does uh, create problems in terms of um, uh, the, the inequality in who benefits, as well as creating massive fiscal issues for the state. 
What we really need is much more careful investment in agriculture, especially in agricultural extension, seed provision, and technology upgradation. Uh, India needs to reduce the fragmentation of agricultural holdings. The reason people don't have high productivity is they don't have big holdings. So they can't use technology. Uh, they, they're averse to using some of that. Um, fragmentation would get reduced if some of these people could lease their land out and go work off the farm. But leasing is also something we haven't uh, made easy, and uh, that holds back uh, some of the uh, increase in size. Perhaps the most important problem in Indian, Indian farming is the price the farmer gets is often very low compared to the price at uh, your table. And that's because there's a whole range of middlemen in between who absorb some of the rents. Every politician comes to power saying, I'm going to make the farmer get more, but they come up against strong vested interests, many of whom have, uh, uh, have political connections amongst the middlemen. And so we found it hard to remove that middleman. There's been initiatives on creating electronic markets, on creating warehouses. We need to do far more of that in order to give the farmer a good deal. In the meantime, India's old habits, you saw an example of that just a few days ago. Uh, when the price of any agricultural commodity gets particularly high, they ban exports of that commodity. Immediately, the price falls, but the poor farmer who for once was getting some benefit from price rising, uh, gets hurt at that point. So farmers are protesting in Maharashtra today because uh, of these bans on it. But this is, this is a problem. We don't have a systematic policy of supporting the farmer with either insurance or uh, procurement at reasonable prices across India. Instead, we do it haphazardly, but often when it comes to a choice between the farmer and the customer, we choose the customer because the customer votes matter a lot. Onion prices are an important political uh, uh, issue in India. And with elections coming up, the price of onions in, in some of the states, the price of onions is extremely important. Other places where we've had mixed success, uh, power. Uh, India is in a position to generate tremendous amounts of power today. Enough, um, you know, for the most part, in going towards 24-7 power in many parts of the country. The problem in India is that we have distribution companies sitting between the consumer and the producer who simply are, um, for want of a better word, incapable of um, uh, running themselves efficiently. So uh, these distribution companies essentially make enormous losses. They're state-owned distribution companies. So in situations where there's plenty of power available, they simply don't buy it and, 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 and sell it to the final consumer because they don't have the finances to buy it. So distribution companies actually are standing in the way. Uh, we do need to um, restructure these distribution companies, put them on a sound financial footing. We've done that three times. And every time we put them back on a sound financial footing, because we haven't changed either the fact that they're not charging adequately for power on the revenue side, and that they see a lot of theft happening of power which they cannot uh, essentially claim, these companies start making big losses once again. So we've restructured them three times. Uh, we will have to do it once again. But we don't seem to learn the lesson that after restructuring, we need to make sure that they are also reasonably profitable. So India is now has the paradox of having huge unutilized generation capacity, but even though the customer wants 24-7 power and can benefit from that, we're not able to provide it to them. So uh, interestingly, uh, power is a, a success story, even despite all this, in the sense that we have been growing power uh, consumption at about 6.5% a year, but much of this is not in the industrial states where power consumption has been relatively flat, but because we're bringing new states into, into electrification and we're growing in that way. Um, ideally, what we'd want to do is create enough power across the country so that we can benefit from electric power. Um, and, and finally, um, um, uh, two other sectors that I'll quickly talk about. We've had 
uh, an attempt at banking sector reforms. Remember, I told you the public sector banks uh, got into trouble by making, making bad loans. Uh, it is generally recognized that we need to improve governance in the public sector banks. And there have been some efforts on this uh, um, under the uh, um, uh, Modi government. We've created uh, something called the Bank Board Bureau to make uh, to recommend some of these public sector appointments. But the real problem is that Bank Board Bureau doesn't have much power. The recommendations it makes goes up to the ministry and then to the uh, prime minister's office in the same way as it's always happened. So it's not an independent agency which can make independent appointments. Similarly, the public sector bank boards have little power of their own um, to appoint the chief executive uh, or uh, to take uh, significant decisions. And as in the past, they have been politicized. And of course, one of the problems with public sector firms is all public sector firms typically overpay at the bottom because that's part of their social function, and they underpay at the top. But this is a bad way to run a firm because you don't get much talent to run the firm uh, because you're underpaying at the top. And this is a problem with uh, the public sector banks also. And, and, and I think this has to be fixed because increasingly in the financial system, there is a need for really capable people to run these banks. But you simply cannot attract them with the kinds of salaries you pay, even if you're willing to recruit from the private sector, which historically hasn't happened, except for two instances, again, to give credit to the Modi government under that government. What has happened most recently is something that I think was unnecessary, and we'll see how it plays out. Uh, recently, what's happened is, in an attempt to improve the public sector banks, uh, we've consolidated them. We've picked you three get together, those three get together, the other three get together. Largely, I think, on the basis of the kind of information technology they use, so that they have the common information technology and also the areas they service. The problem, as everybody associated with banking knows, is mergers take a lot of time and are a big headache. Who occupies which position? Who, how do we merge departments together, et cetera, et cetera? These bank mergers are coming at a time the banks are already dealing with high levels of NPAs, non-performing assets. They're uh, coming at a time that the economy is slowing. It's probably not the right time. It may be the right move, but it's not the right time. And banks, public sector banks, are going to be engulfed in managing the mergers over the next few years instead of actually uh, focusing on making better loans. And, and finally, one of the problems with public sector banks is that they have government mandates imposed on them. Thou shalt do this. And those mandates are generally uncompensated. The latest mandate uh, is, comes from the Modi government's emphasis on uh, lending to small and medium companies. Uh, there was a whole scheme called the Mudra scheme, uh, which got them to lend. Unfortunately, that experience hasn't been turning out particularly well. So what do we do when that experience doesn't turn out well? Do we clean up the system? I think what we've seen now is an attempt to try and not recognize the problem, which is we're going to have forbearance on the MSME loans that go bad. In other words, they will not be recognized. And uh, in fact, we're going the other way. Uh, in order to revive credit, because credit is not flowing, we now have the concept of loan mela. Um, those of you, anybody know what a mela is? It's a fair, right? And a loan mela is a loan fair. Come one, come all, get your loan, right? Now, you wonder how much credit, uh, you know, careful credit assessment goes in when you're supposed to give loans in a loan mela. I think the uh, early signs are uh, the banks are trying to do credit analysis we will see going forward what kind of pressure they are subject to in order to make these loans. So the broader problem is the public sector banks are in difficulty. The reality is they need significant governance reform. Uh, much of what is being done is uh, initially there was some appetite to do it. Unfortunately, now we're doing stuff which probably takes away from governance, takes away from cleaning up the balance sheet, rather than necessarily improving the quality of their balance sheet.
Um, one example uh, of uh, um, 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 this that I, I, I pointed to was the, uh, the pressure on public sector banks to make some of these MSME loans. Um, and finally, uh, 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 let me come to the issue of trade and investment. Uh, that has been a, a focus of the Modi government, a good and necessary focus. Um, however, uh, what trade and investment needs really is an increase in the ease of doing business. Because ultimately, you get more trade if you have more efficient firms who are able to produce both for the domestic economy and internationally. Now, here again, uh, what one would want for is a, a slashing in some of the old regulations that hold back firms uh, and uh, focusing on improving the ease of doing business. Now, there's been some attention, but largely focused on the World Bank indicators of the ease of doing business rather than the actual conditions in India on what prevents businesses from working easily. So as a result, we haven't got that significant boost so far in business opening uh, because, in fact, uh, it may not have become that much easier for businesses uh, to, um, uh, to operate in India. One of the uh, recent concerns has been uh, on, on tariffs and taxes. Uh, if you want more trade, you should bring down your tariffs because today uh, the way trade happens is through global supply chains, moving goods back and forth. In order to move goods back and forth across borders, you need low and stable tariffs. Instead, what we have is high and fluctuating tariffs in certain areas. Not all areas, but certain areas. And that becomes a concern for business. What will the tariff be next month if, in fact, uh, I, I open a business here? India is not part of any significant global supply chains, and that makes it a problem if India wants to increase its exports. Similarly, taxes, uh, the recent cut in corporate taxes is beneficial in attracting firms to India. But what firms worry about is not just the level, but the changes. Is this going to change? Am I assured that when I put my investment in India, it will stay at 15 to 17%? And unfortunately, in India, we have a history of going back and forth, some of which was reflected in the recent budget in, in taxes on foreign investors. So we need to have a process by which we stabilize rules and regulations and taxes and tariffs if we want to attract new companies into India. Uh, that's one reason why if you look at the level of foreign direct investment in India, despite the emphasis on make in India, you see on the last four years, the level of foreign direct investment hasn't changed very much. We get about $40 billion. In comparison, Brazil gets $90 billion in FDI. I'm not even talking about China. China is is a different, um, uh, occupies a different space. Um, we have had some successes. We have had some successes. Uh, for example, uh, in India, uh, we, um, actually, let, let me start with a success, uh, cell phones. Cell phones, uh, we are starting to assemble more cell phones in India. Uh, and this has gone up. Uh, um, if you look at the uh, cell phone imports, they have come down significantly, and that's not because we're buying fewer cell phones, it's because we're importing less. And if you look at exports, that is the black uh, bar there, that has gone up. So India is starting to export cell phones that it assembles in India. That's good. The problem, however, is it's largely just assembly, because uh, one of the counterparts to the increasing cell phones is the fact that you look at electronic components, we're importing far more. That's the, uh, if you look here, here, we're importing far more electronic components as cell phone uh, production is increasing. In other words, we are doing assembly. Now, that's not to be sneezed at. We didn't do assembly before. And doing assembly today is a good thing, but it's not value-added assembly. It's basically importing the components and putting them together. In places which are more value-added, and uh, this is why I want you to look at textiles. China is moving out of textiles, right? Who's taking its place? India's moved up from about 
of world exports in textiles to 3.3%. Now, that might seem like a, uh, a reasonable number, but it, it's over a period of nearly 20 years. On the other hand, if you look at Bangladesh, it's gone from 2.6 to 6.4%. If you look at Vietnam, it's gone from 0.9 to 6.2. So Vietnam and Bangladesh are absorbing the textile market. While we have plenty of people to work, and we're not getting any of the textile market. That suggests we are still not seen as an export-friendly place. Okay, um, Our businesses are not doing as well as they should. And what's holding us back, we don't have appropriate logistics, power, land, office space, and qualified manpower relative to some of these other countries. Uh, even uh, a comparator that we think is very similar to us, such as Bangladesh. And so that's something to worry about. Uh, let me um, uh, end this talk about the sectoral issues, and then I'll come to what's going wrong. Um, uh, one place where the Modi government has had a fair amount of success is in people-oriented things. Um, for example, what uh, I think you coined the term jam, uh, what Arvind calls jam, Jandhan, which is a bank account for everybody, Aadhaar, which is the unique ID, and uh, mobile phones. You combine these two, you can do direct benefit transfer. And what the government has been doing increasingly is do more direct benefit transfers for things like pensions, subsidies, scholarships, etc. That's been a great improvement in the lives of people because uh, instead of going petitioning a government officer to release their pension, they now get it directly in their bank account. That's something uh, really important. Uh, similarly, Clean India, Swachh Bharat, the uh, signature program of uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, in building toilets for all. Now, there's a lot of complaint that these toilets are built, don't have connections to the, um, uh, to the um, sewerage system, and essentially are non-functional. But nevertheless, a large number has been built, and there is a change to some extent in how these are viewed. So that is a benefit. India needed to end open defecation, and uh, if we've made some progress, if not actually achieved that goal, it is an important step forward. Similarly, uh, um, you know, attempts to reduce the burdens on the poor, cooking gas, for example, for the very poor, uh, that's very beneficial because they don't have to burn wood, which can be tremendously harmful for the housewife as she uh, breathes that wood. So cooking gas connections for the poor, another positive uh, uh, with the subsidies for that cooking gas being paid to these direct benefit transfers. And finally, Ayushman Bharat, the attempt for healthcare for all, uh, at least for the very poor, I think is an important step forward. Uh, uh. Now, all these are, are good steps, but clearly uh, there is more need for rigorous evaluation of how they're working and to m make sure they work uh, as well as they can. For example, um, there was investigation of accounts and while a lot of accounts had been opened, some hadn't been used, simply because uh, when you give bureaucrats a number to achieve, they achieve it without necessarily thinking about the larger goal, which is accounts need to be opened but also used. Similarly, toilets need to be built but also used. And um, uh, so there is a, uh, we have to work on this to make it much more effective, uh, but it's an important step forward. And finally, there are, as with everything in India, accusations of fraud. For example, with the healthcare program, now there is talk of some of the private hospitals having built the government uh, and, uh, and um, build it for things that are not actually happening. Let me spend three minutes, and then I'll go over to you, on uh, what's going on and, and why, uh, why is India slowing uh, despite all these reforms. And uh, I would argue that, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, there's an attempt to say this is because of the outside, uh, the world is slowing. Well, the world actually was uh, growing more slowly in the earlier period. Um, sometimes we want to pin it on oil. Well, oil is actually cheaper now than it was in the earlier period when we were growing strongly. And of course, uh, sometimes we want to pin it on trade. But trade has been relatively uh, weak in both periods. I think looking to the outside, uh, to blame the outside for what's going on is probably wrong. What is probably a better explanation is really this is a consequence of not having invested for nearly 15 years, uh, or I, I should say um, probably 
since the global financial crisis, not having picked up the pace of investment, that's one. And the second is the lack of reform, of significant reform over the same period. And both those have combined with, these are acts of omission in some sense, with acts of commission. The sequence of demonetization and the goods of service tax essentially was a straw that seems to have broken the Indian economy's uh, back because uh, uh, it came at a point when the economy was already relatively uh, weak. So if you look at uh, um, uh, one uh, investment, we have slowed down relative to our peers. That's one big source of concern. But if you look at uh, why things have slowed down, you see that uh, post demonetization, we had a substantial fall in growth. Then we had the goods and services tax. I think that just about that time, the economy was rebounding from the demonetization, but that uh, the effects of the goods and services tax plus the NBFC crisis, all those compounded once again to bring these things down. The bottom line is uh, we need to essentially enhance growth. Uh, last point I will say is all this is before we even come to Arvind Subramanian's critique. Arvind argues that even this low level of growth, uh, he's not talking about the most recent, but he's talking up to 2016, uh, even that growth may be somewhat mismeasured. Uh, and uh, essentially, this is the slide that he wants us to look at, which is in the previous period, pre-2011 growth, we had substantial investment, credit, exports, imports. Uh, and since then, what we've seen is that everything has tanked, except the GDP number. Even though investment has come down, credit has come down, uh, um, exports have come down, GDP has not come down. That's one, one uh, version of what he's trying to say. The other version of what he's trying to say, I, I think this I found very interesting, is when you look at the central government's direct tax collections, even that has fallen considerably. When a country grows richer, actually taxes go up because people move into higher tax brackets and, are, and can pay more. And especially with all the reforms this government has done, we should see higher taxes. Instead, real taxes act have actually fallen, as have nominal taxes over this period. So that's something to con of concern. Let me end. So basically, uh, signs of deep malice, growth is significantly lower, the fiscal space is narrowing, debt industry is growing. India is losing its economic way. I will argue next time that uh, perhaps the reason is because we are centralizing power without a persuasive economic vision. And if we do this, we risk wasting the, economic, uh, the demographic dividend. Uh, we talk a lot more about this in the next talk. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Um, our commentator is Arvind Subramaniam. Um, he's currently visiting lecture in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School um, and non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics in Washington. Um, he was a chief economic advisor to the government of India between October 2014 and July 2018, almost, almost four years. And as chief economic advisor, he oversaw the publication of the annual Economic Survey of India, which became a very widely read document. And here is a piece of statistics that you'd find very interesting. The 2018 survey had 20 million views from over 190 countries in his first year of publication. So uh, I, I don't think, I mean, novels are read that widely. Um, and, uh, and pop books are read that widely, but the idea that a, an economic survey document, an annual economic survey document, had 20 million views over 190 countries, we've all um, given Arvind credit for that. Um, uh, his latest best-selling book uh, is a reflection on his time spent at the Chief Economic Advisor of Council, The Challenges of the Modi Jetli Economy, published last year. December 2018, and while at the Peterson Institute, he um, wrote the award-winning book that many of us read, Eclipse, 
living in the shadow of China's economic dominance, that was 2011, printed 130,000 copies sold worldwide. So let's welcome Arvind uh, to Brown, and uh, he'll speak for 15 minutes or so um, and comment on Raghu's lecture. <clears throat> Thanks. Can, um, can, can the PowerPoint be yeah. replaced? OK, while that's being done, um, let me um, thank uh, Ashu, uh, Brown, and the Watson Center. Uh, for inviting me to uh, provide comments on uh, uh, Raghu's first lecture. Um, it, it's a real uh, pleasure to be uh, uh, discussing it uh, because, I mean, as you saw, very thoughtful. I, th I thought uh, Stephanie and they said they downloaded it. And you want to check? Yeah, uh, while it's being uploaded. Uh, so, yeah. So, so uh, as you saw, it's a, a very, very thoughtful and comprehensive lecture. Um, and it's a pleasure to comment on it because, you know, there's a lot to agree with. Uh, there's some amount to disagree with. And I think uh, there's also lots to kind of think, uh, collectively think through uh, going forward. Uh, uh, I think uh, so. So let me summarize um, Raghu's. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. L let me summarize uh, Raghu's uh, uh, lecture, a really thoughtful lecture, by saying, you know, the diagnosis is that there is a deep malaise, growth, fiscal debt, and distress, and the explanation he unfortunately didn't uh, spend enough time on. And maybe I'll 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 kind of take issue with it, even though he, he didn't. Uh, Elaborate uh, on that, which I think is is, is actually quite a, a, a interesting and insightful and kind of a nice way of looking at it. I mean, I, I'll disagree with it, but I still think it's worth uh, uh, thinking about. The explanation is that you know India is losing its economic way, in part because it's centralizing power without necessarily having a, a, a concomitant uh, economic vision, as it were. Uh, so, so let me take each of these. Um, um, uh, just in the interest of time, let, I won't do the overview of the overview, but let me um, start with the diagnosis. I, I think uh, Raghu and I, I think, probably uh, are on the same page, and I think uh, he emphasized this quite a lot. And I just want to emphasize uh, again that uh, the malaise is not recent. I, I think there's a, a much longer period of malaise afflicting the economy. My own view, and I think, again, echoing very much what Raghu says, that essentially India never recovered from the global financial crisis. Uh, and if you look at, you know, if you look at economic growth in around developing countries, what motors it, the, the main engine are investment and exports. Those things drive growth in India, they drove growth uh, in East Asia. Essentially, those two engines have basically collapsed. Uh, you know, Investment collapse is around 2010, uh, and you can see the difference between the two periods. Uh, and, and, and the credit thing also collapses along with investment, and, and trade collapses as well. And where uh, I disagree with all the analysts for reasons I would say is that actually consume consumption, the other engine of growth, also actually collapses and only perks up very briefly in 2016, 17, and. Uh, and 17, 18, because of this credit bubble that the NBFCs fuel. So consumption also, so basically everything <clears throat> really declines. Um, and uh, so the economy is a very different economy uh, post-global financial crisis. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't get reflected in, in, in GDP growth. Uh, Raghu mentioned that. I don't want to talk about this, but I will come back to that later uh, in a while. So, so think about the two engines of growth, I think, um, uh, collapsing. Um, and um, I'm not going to talk about the export collapse because I think it's much more complicated uh, 
Uh, I've been doing some recent work with a colleague. Uh, I, if, in, if there's q and I'll, I'll talk about this. I think the export story, I understand actually a little bit less. Um, I, I think uh, it's the investment and credit story that I want to uh, focus on a, a little bit more. And as you can see, essentially, if you look at uh, what I call the twin balance sheet challenge, this is what I thought afflicted the Indian economy, which is firms are in, over indebted because of the boom. They over invested. Uh, things went bad. They saddled with all this huge amounts of debt. The counterpart, uh, uh, bad loans are with the banks. So, so bank balance sheets are stressed. Corporate balance sheets are stressed. Corporate profits are down, and therefore we have what Keynes might have called a magneto problem, which is essentially the financial system is jammed, and, and, and firms are also heavily reluctant uh, to, to invest. So I think this is in some ways the – and this has been with us, as kind of Raghu also said, since the global financial crisis. Uh, I think uh, I'll come to what it's morphed into in just a second, but I think this is at the heart of – what has been uh, India's challenge over the last 10 years. I think what uh, uh, the government and the RBI and some of what Raghu says is that, would say is that, look, it's one of many problems. And in any case, we've done a lot of things, including, as Raghu said, the insolvency and bankruptcy code. Um, and so, I mean, we're acting. It's, it's one among many problems. We're acting. And so what's the problem? And I'm going to argue that this is kind of neither captures how critical the problem is and nor uh, how uh, insufficient the response has been. And I think this has been a key, I think, uh, problem challenge holding back the inadequacy of the response and maybe an under-recognition of how serious the problem is. So, uh, you know, at the risk of wading into, you know, what is Raghu's natural territory, I'm not a, a banking expert, but I do want to dwell on this for some time because I think uh, that there are things here which speak very deeply about the Indian economy. And, and I would like, you know, uh, uh, there's no one better than Raghu to kind of help us think through this. Uh, but I think there are things which I think I disagree a little bit with him and maybe things which he also maybe didn't emphasize enough. And I want to go through that. So when you want to solve this problem of, you know, balance sheets on both sides being stressed, I think you want to do what I would call the five R's. You want to do recognition. You want to recognize what the magnitude of the problem is. You don't want to hide it under the carpet. Resolution, all the, you know, the bad loans with the companies, you want to kind of extract whatever value there is or liquidate it. Otherwise, you know, they can't clean up the balance sheet. They can't invest. And then, you know, banks have to take a hit. You have to recapitalize. Uh, of course, the regulator has to re uh, regulate. And all of this has to be done along with changing the way banks operate in order to prevent the recurrence of the problem, uh, especially with the public sector banks in India. I think we've had a big problem. So how have we fared on these five R's over the last, uh, whatever, five, six years? And I would say that on recognition, I think uh, Raghu being modest, I think uh, glossed over the fact that I think the asset quality review that he started in 2015 and 2016, I think did quite a lot to actually for the banking system to come, come clean. But I would argue still that, you know, uh, you know this is something uh, I have to point out, Raghu, is that, you know, for so many years, RBI, Severe stress estimates of what the bank loans were were much below what it actually turned out to be and much below what many common so, so I think Rabu came along and uh, I think activated the cost, but I think we were behind the curve for a very long time. So recognition achieved, Rabu gets a lot of credit for that, uh, but delayed. And now this is the problem. We are back to uncertainty. Because of all the things that are happening, we don't know now how much is the problem with the non-bank financial companies and the rebound. I mean, the consequence of those back to the public sector banks. So I would argue that you know the asset quality review that Raghu initiated, we, I think, is sorely overdue for another one, both for the NBFCs and the banks, because once again, there's too much uh, uncertainty. 
and sure, I, I think is where I'd be most critical of, of um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the RBI and, and, and government. I think when you think about a financial system, um, I think it has to be regulated. I think we've had so many kind of big kind of problems and scandals that, frankly, you know, we even didn't even recognize that these were problems for a very, very long time. I mean, uh, what is happening now is that the NBS blue line has stopped, and Raghu alluded to the fact that, you know, quality now is becoming a concern with these NBS. But even before that, ILFS, Raghu, 90,000 crore company escaped. You know, it's not that people, you know, it's one thing, I think, to say, look, we knew what the problem was, but we are limited in what we can do because all kinds of political concerns. And I think that's a very valid argument. And I think there are many cases here where I think the RBI could invoke that thing. But there are some things we just completely Everybody missed. Uh, ILFS came out of left field, completely unrecognized, unidentified. And so we've had a series of scan, I mean, really major problems. Uh, and so the quality of regulation, I think, has been uh, seriously inadequate, both by the RBI and, of course, by the government. So I think regulation has been uh, a, a big problem. I think as on the resolution, see, remember, why is resolution so important? I think if you were to ask me, describe what happened, describe Indian development over the last 50 years in one sentence, I would say India went from socialism without entry to capitalism without exit. So basically, there's no exit in India. So, so why the IBC is so important, why resolution is so important, is because, you know, we, I mean, Capitalism is as much about getting out as about coming in. Uh, that's what Schumpeter told us, this, the destruction part of creative destruction. I think we've not been successful for the reasons that Raghu mentioned. And I think this IBC was a, is a very good initiative. But after initial successes, the magnitudes, the recoveries, the timing have all slipped. And so now, you know, we're kind of have, having to reassess once again. I think on the reform, uh, very limited reform. The PSBs still thrive. Uh, many banks, which ought not to be lending, which were under some kind of close supervision, have been brought back to life. But I think some good actions have been taken uh, on the private sector banks. Um, so th that's kind of... Uh, so my uh, overall assessment of this is that, you know, of the five hours, there's been financing. Uh, the financial system has been kept alive basically through recapitalization. I mean, the government has in fact pumped, uh, you know, three, about 3.1 billion, uh, a trillion rupees into the banking system. And it's been kept alive through recapitalization and through weakening of the regulatory standards. You saw the NBFC lending, basically a form of a weakening of regulatory standards. So in a sense, what's happened is that now today, as a consequence of limited action, limited reform, the fact that growth has been slow, we've really gone from a twin balance sheet challenge, which was the banks and the infrastructure companies, to what I would call a twin plus twin uh, balance sheet challenge, where on the financial side, the non-bank financial companies have been added to the stress. And on the borrowing side, it's not just big infrastructure companies, but certainly real estate companies have also come into the problematic category. So we have a twin balance sheet, a twin plus twin balance sheet challenge. We have rising uh, MPH once again and, and intensification of cost of stress. And this is a chart from uh, 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 Ashish Gupta of the speech. We have MPH rising, we are coming down, but now they've jumped once again and we are back at uh, you know very high levels. And remember, uh, this is something that I don't know whether uh, I'm going to call it the Subramanian law of non-recognition. Maybe uh, Raghu will agree with that. At any point in time in any financial system, the stressed assets are 25, 30, 40% more than what the regulator wants you to believe or what they claim it is at any point in time. So, so, so this is uh, almost, you know, we, we can't, I mean, this is, it says it's gone up officially, but we don't really know. Uh, so in a sense, investment and growth cannot durably revive. 
unless we address the skill plus skill challenge. And that's why I think it kind of echoes what uh, Raghut has said towards the end, that if we don't crack this financial system thing in some reasonable way, we will be in this kind of eternal cycle of you know, bad lending or, or you know, uh, problematic lending, uh, uh, financing, very little reform, and the cycle just continues again and again. And I don't think, frankly, we've been able to crack it. We've tried, but it really hasn't happened. And I think this is one of the big bottlenecks uh, that the Indian system faces going forward. Now let me come to, uh, I think, what Raghu didn't talk about, and maybe if I'm putting words in Raghu's mouth, I think he should uh, 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 challenge uh, me. I think Raghu's point is that there's kind of lack of a persuasive vision, and there's a kind of centralization of power. Yeah, uh, uh, five minutes. What I would argue is that I think more broadly, I don't think there is a lack of vision. I think you may want to dispute the vision, but, but I, I think that there is a, a lot of vision and a kind of thing in what went on. Give you an example. I actually think that uh, what Raghu called the kind of the, the household stuff is actually a grand vision, which I would call the new welfareism, which is, it's very, very, you know, kind of carefully thought, thought out. It's the public provision of essential private goods and services to the poor. And it's, you know, uh, bank accounts, cooking gas, toilets, housing, power, medical insurance, and now water. It is, it's a vision, it's backed up with zealous implementation, and it's backed up with really far-sighted political thinking. So, so, so you may agree, disagree, but I think you have to accept that this is a, a, a really the animating vision of, 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 of the Modi government. Similarly, on, on GST, I, I think that you, you know, there is a little bit of a trap, while I agree with what Raghu said, there's a bit of a trap when you assess all these things. I mean, it's like when the economist's wife turns to the economist and says, honey, do you love me? And he says, relative to what? You know? so, so I think you have to say, uh, relative to what, the, the GST? Relative to what happened when before, I think it's a vast improvement. Relative to what it could have been, Raghu is absolutely right. I think uh, you know implementation could have been uh, could have been much much better. But I think the process is by and large, you know, it's it's learning. They're, they're making mistakes, but they're learning, and so I think I'm still quite hopeful on the GST. Similarly, the IBC. It's a very reasonable response to the twin balance sheet challenge. It's just proving insufficient, so we need to correct. But you can't accuse the government of a lack of vision or not doing the right thing. Similarly, I think demonetization, you cannot accuse it of lack of vision, whatever else you may want to accuse it of. I think it's part of some very... And similarly, there's recently been some you know, bold and welcome corporate tax reform. So if UPA2 was paralysis, I think Modi1 was hyperactivity with vision. So I think that can't be the, the, the criticism. Now... I'm kind of going to be, uh, cheat a little bit and anticipate what Raghu is going to say and criticize that to some extent, because you say, Raghu, there's no vision. Instead, we, sh we should have an alternative vision. And the alternative vision is do land reform, labor reform, reduce ease of doing business, improve state capacity, you know, the, the same litany. And my response to that list is, one, if these were so blindingly obvious and good, why haven't we been able to do it for 40 years? So even as you recommend this, you must have the, you know, some sense of how you're going to articulate the politics in a way that's going to be different from the past, which will allow that to be implemented. Similarly, I think it's very important when you allocate this thing. Analytically, if these were such important binding constraints, how come we enjoyed a decade of gangbuster growth without any of this stuff? You know, we should, in, in, between about 2002 and 2010, 11, India grew gangbusters, exports grew gangbusters. None of these things were a problem. How come suddenly they're a problem? So we have to think more carefully about this. Similarly, when you talk about, you know, a state capacity or whatever, I think you must remember in India the, the intelligent question is not why is state capacity poor. I don't think it's a good question. The good question is why is it that state capacity is so good? GST, Aadhaar, Mandrega, we can roll things out on scale. I mean, whatever, warts and all, but it's 
we can't do other things on scale. So I think that's the interesting question, not that state capacity is uniformly weak, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, when we talk about agriculture, I think Raghu was absolutely spot on in saying agriculture is a huge problem in India. But even as you say that, and even as we kind of recognize something needs to be done, we have to confront the fact that in India, almost every subject now going forward cannot be done by the center or by the states. That, that, those days are gone. It has to be done cooperatively. Agriculture, some policies are controlled by the center, some policies are controlled by the state. Power, some aspects controlled by the center, some aspects controlled by the state. So the question is, it's not centralization, decentralization, but how do we do cooperative federalism? And we did it so well on the GST, why can't we do it on the other? And so that, I think, those are the kind of questions we need to be asking and thinking why. So let me end with a couple of kind of deeper thoughts, two, three minutes, and, and, and I end. I said, see, while, I mean, I kind of a little bit disagree with Raghu that the problem is a lack of vision, et cetera, but what then is the problem? To me, I think certainly there was a, a problem of underdiagnosis. If almost every major indicator is tanking, and yet your GDP is saying the numbers are pretty good. You go to a policymaker and say, look, all this is happening. But he says, no, we're doing well. GDP growth is 7%. What's the problem? So I, I think that this data issue that uh, Raghu highlighted has had deeper implications than just a question of you know, credibility and things. It has influenced the incentive for reform, the urgency for reform, in a way that I think uh, that applies to the GDP data the employment data, the fiscal data, and of course, once again, the quality of assets in the banking system. If, for example, today an asset quality uh, delivered like the, the Raghu asset quality review, and you know the numbers are, are kind of stark and shocking, I think the impetus for action will be, I think, quite different. I, on the financial sector, having been critical of both government and RBI, I actually am really, <laughs> skeptical about, can we really crack the problem? Because the problems are much deeper. Raghu, you know, governance reform of the, of the public sector banks ain't going to happen. I mean, it's, it's like Einstein's definition of insanity. You know, you may do the same thing over and over again, but really nothing changes, right? No, no even bank board, governance, I, I, see, because I think it's a much deeper problem is, you know, we have this stigmatized capitalism problem. I think there are skeletons all over the place, right? And regulator and government, do they really have the incentives, the ability to crack through this? And there's the, what I call the 4C problem in India. What the 4C problem is, the investigative institutions are hyperactive. Uh, CBI, um, courts, C CVC, CAG. So there's kind of decision-making paralysis in all public sector agencies, including the banks. So the question is, you know, can we crack this? Uh, I don't know, because if we don't crack that, I'm not sure how we can do, you know, private investment com coming back again. Um, I I've spoken about center and states. Um, I'll end on this, uh, two last points. I think that more and more I think about this and more and more I see what the reactions to you know, some of the GDP work that I've done is, I think, you know, countries carry these narratives about, you know, including about growth. So, for example, India, I think there is this now cognitive benchmark that because we did so well for 10 years, that we're kind of entitled to this going forward. And so, so, so it's almost as if, you know, you, you, you're lulled into believing that, you know, you do nothing and you're owed 7 8% growth instead of saying, you know, no, so, so I think one critical understanding that India collectively needs to come to is whether 2000s were the aberration or were they normal. I think you could make the case that the 2000s were the aberration. And let me give you one piece of evidence which I'm working on. If you look at exports performance of India, India in the post-global financial crisis period has actually done better than the world. What happened in the 2000s was we did 
exceptionally better than the world. I mean, we did get, I think we were the fastest growing exporting economy between 2002, faster than China, by the way, between 2002 and 2011, uh, 10, 11. So was that the normal or going back to being a normal exporting economy? That's, and I don't have a very good answer for that, but I think it's very important because if we think that, you know, the exceptional performance was, was the norm, then I think we might be in for disappointments. And, you know, especially if you think we can do that without all, all the hard work. Last point, I think, is that I think in all of this, when we assess governments, what is the model we have for how governments behave? And I think that's something that, you know, we need to think about much more deeply. I mean, it's possible that the model is, you know, we deliver low inflation, and, and Raghu, was, his onion example was spot on. I think there's a big premium on delivering low inflation, even if there are costs elsewhere in the system. I mean, if, for example, the model is you deliver low inflation and you deliver the new welfareism, and you think that that's going to be good politics, then, you know, that's a very different approach to policy making than someone who says, you know, I want to reform, I want to get growth, et cetera, et cetera. So I think our understanding of how politics and political models work, I think needs to be much more sharpened, especially in the context of all that's happened in India in the last five, 10 years. Uh, sorry, I've kept you too long. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, 17. Um, would you, Raghu, would you like to respond to him or shall we collect responses from the audience? What would you like? Well, let, I mean, since this is fresh on people's mind, let me quickly uh, talk about a couple of things. First, Arvind, uh, problems in the financial system are a symptom of problems elsewhere. If you don't have profitability, you get more bad loans. If you don't have reforms which allow you to put in the infrastructure, you get more bad infrastructure loans. So to think of this as exogenous, and the real problem is cleaning up in the banking system, is really missing uh, you know, a lot. And so the question you should be asking is, why don't we have the conditions for growth that we had in the two, before pre-financial crisis period? And blaming it all on the outside is, I think, too easy. Blaming it all on slow growth elsewhere, India is poor. It has a lot of potential for growth on its own without relying on the outside. Yes, exports help tremendously then, it helped less now, but why aren't we growing, maybe not at 10, 9, 10%, but at 7, 8%, uh, why are we growing so slowly? So uh, to put financial sector problems before, I think is, is probably missing the card for the horse. Uh, Trade over GDP should be 40%, right? Or it's, it's not there? Uh, it's come down. It's come, come down. down. Yeah. What, uh, it's come down everywhere in the world. Uh, everywhere in the world. So it's what? It's not 32, but, 33 percent, something like in that. India? Yeah. Uh, in India, it's something like, a f no, it's, it's, it's 45, uh, goods and non factor services, but 45 percent. 40, 40, 40. Uh, <clears throat> the second, uh, which I didn't get to and which I'll talk a little, lot more about, which is the broader vision of the Modi government. I mean, <laughs> I, I find it strange you call demonetization something with vision. Uh, uh, it's, it, 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 I mean, there are, of course, everything has a vision behind it. The question is, is it a coherent vision? Is it a vision that takes us forward? And unfortunately, I disagree with you on that particular act, whether it uh, signifies it's, it's, it's a vision worth having, especially if it's, uh, it's so poorly, um, if its effects are so, so, so bad. On GST, this has been in the Indian DNA for a long time. What the BJP did was it didn't have it opposing <laughs> the GST and managed to get it through the, uh, the parliament, which was a coup, absolutely. But uh, the problem was, after getting it through, it wasn't properly executed. And uh, yes, uh, I, I agree with you, cup half full, cup half empty. But this is a government which is known for implementation. Uh, why wasn't more thought given to implementation there? Apart from that, the bankruptcy code has been talked about for a long time, uh, as you know, both in UPA and, uh, and NDA, and finally the NDA did it, which is good. But again, these are, not, these are things that are in the, in the pipe uh, line, so to speak, of ideas. The question is, how do you put all this together into a coherent set of ideas? And that's where I think there's incoherence. 
You say you want to export more. At the same time, you keep increasing tariffs, keep changing taxes. You're not creating an environment to get an export-led economy. That's the sense in which I think we need far more coherence. You want bureaucrats to go out there and actually make decisions. You're empowering them. At the same time, you file cases against the previous government's bureaucrats for taking decisions which seem like in the ordinary course of business. So what is your vision if, you, if you're not thinking through all this? That's, that's the question I have. Um, Arvind, uh, one question for you. What, what is your estimate um, of um, the negative effect of demonetization and growth? Yeah, uh, look, I've not done any uh, uh, independent assessment, but let me say uh, one or two uh, things, things on that. Uh, one, as Raghu rightly said, I think on the informal sector, we don't know. Uh, uh, we've had some studies which say they could be uh, sizable. Uh, that's point one. Point two, but if you see this latest study, Gita Group uh, study, I think what is surprising about that is how small and brief the impact is on GDP. So, 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 uh, so, so that's kind of, to me, kind of the puzzle is why we don't see much bigger impacts on the big numbers of demonetization than, than I think the studies uh, are suggesting. And I have one plausible explanation, but I, I know I, I'm not. Uh, uh, but but so it's both that the impact on the informal sector was sizable, but we don't uh, haven't measured it enough. But the studies on the formal things seem to suggest that they were actually, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, surprisingly uh, 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 small. But if if the if the an estimated 90% of the workforce or 85% of the workforce or 93 what the actual number is now, was in the informal sector and was hit by demonetization, then isn't it, logically speaking, going to cause a, a, a lot of dislocation and, and therefore a, a reduction in growth? I mean, just look at the broad GDP numbers, right? You see from that quarter of demonetization a steep fall people for the next two or three quarters. I mean, we have the picture up there. What do you attribute that to? Because the world economy wasn't tanking at that point. So, so Raghu, you know, I was looking at, at these numbers a little bit more carefully last night. See, if you look at actually the, the Indian annual GDP growth rates, look, first, I mean, I, I'm not trying to defend demonetization or say, I, I, I do think that, you know, the impacts were substantially adverse in the informal sector. I'm just surprised you're not picking it up in the GDP numbers. I think the Gita Gobinath study is probably the most, you know, rigorous that we have. And what I was surprised by looking last night is, uh, if you look at the, at the annual numbers, all your numbers actually pick up. See, 15, 16 is the low point. Growth, you know, picks up in 16, 17, and 17, 18. According to all the, so whatever the quarterly fluctuations, the trend after 15, 17 is, is up. Growth peaks in summer of 1617, in that summer. That's the first quarter by Indian uh, um, calendar. And then uh, demonetization occurs just after the second quarter. And since then, the numbers, I mean, since the second quarter, it's been plunged. Yeah, see, the, I, I think what, is, what confounds everything is that, remember that the, the, the NBFC credit surge happens from about, if you look at the numbers, 16, 17, it surges. Yeah. So, so that, I think, masks the impact. So demonetization uh, has an adverse there. impact, but, but non-bank finance sector is beginning to yeah. give a lot of loans. And, and maybe that's and so confounding. It makes up, yeah. it makes up to, to a substantial extent. Exactly. And that's why Gita Gobinath, one reason would be that's why she's not getting... No, no, no. She, she has, she, in she, principle, has she, not... she controls for all that. That's... I have an identification strategy one one could debate, okay. but th that's not the point. The, yeah. the broader point is. I mean, but I the don't point I... here is yeah. is my my broader point was, uh, which I didn't come to, which I'll come to in the next talk. That one of the problems with the way economic policy is carried out in India, there are these legacy programs, GST, etc., which are normal, reasonable things to do, and then there are sudden brain waves. The corporate tax cut, for example or demonetization, uh, which uh, essentially haven't been uh, 
part of a larger sort of discussion. If one was to cut taxes today, would one cut it on corporations or would Indeed. one cut it on the broader public? I mean, now there's a lot of talk about cutting it for the broader public. I mean, these are questions that need to be debated and thought through more carefully. One of the worries is these decisions are happening without that broader discussion and how it fits into the broader re reform process. Let's go to the audience. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. So I, let's see hands first. Rajiv has an hand. Rajiv Vora. So I'm not sure Raghu is the right person to answer that. This is for political scientists. This is for political scientists. Go ahead, Ashu. You, uh, no, but Rajiv's I, I, assumption is that economics drives elections. <laughs> yeah. Religious nationalism is, uh, is a rather serious force <laughs> no, no, but in see, determining. You can, we can, if you... On one axis, you have demonetized and pain inflicted by that. On another, the expectation of, you know, the, the, the benefits that religious nationalism would bring to, to, the, to the Hindu majority. You compare the two, you calculate which one is better. Uh, uh, but let, let me just yeah. attempt an answer. Uh, as an economist, I don't know anything about politics, right? But uh, the, I mean, I think the narrative was, look, those fat cats uh, who cheated on their taxes are standing in line with you. And they've lost a lot of this money. That's why the details on how much money came back were not released, because it gave the impression that a lot of these people had lost money, and they were standing in line along with you. Well, of course, they didn't. They paid 10%. That was the going rate for converting black to white. And of course, instead of their black money sitting in their basement earning no interest, it now was earning interest in the public sector banks. But that's a different issue. The, the issue is... It was popular because finally somebody, and, and this was how it was sold, we're taking on the vested interests. And I'm not in any way defending the tax evaders. We need to get them. It just seemed that if you look at all that happened, the tax evaders managed to get their money back in the banks. None of them have actually been prosecuted uh, in a significant way. This was what Yashwan Sinha said would happen, and we're seeing it happen. On the other hand, uh, the broader public, including the very poor, suffered a lot during this period, both in terms of the harassment of standing in those lines, but also in seeing their businesses collapse because they couldn't get credit for the few days. There. So that is a concern, that this was not thought through on who it would impact and whether it would have any positive effect at but, all. But there's no regret on the part of the ruling regime, but they won, kept winning elections, despite all this. Yeah. Mm. Politician either, but I I I I, I have a, a some a, a, a chapter in in my book is devoted to this. I almost I, I don't completely buy or believe what I argued completely, but I think there is a strong shelling like case to be made that the economic costs and the severity were intrinsic to the political success, the, i.e. That the, that's a feature, not a bug of that. Uh, and we can go into it over dinner. I'll explain why that's the case. But I think, you know, for me, what was also, you know, when we talk about the GST, I think the other problem with the GST was it was burdened by the fact that uh, uh, demonetization preceded it. Uh, and so the GST had, you know, and, the, and demonetization, the the, the the as Raghu said, the GST was I think in in concept and design I think everyone agreed with it, but it in the short run affected the same people that demonetization affected. So GST had to carry the burden of its implementing GST, but also the, the burden of, of demonetization. Other questions? Yes, sir. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I think so. Coherence of the vision that I think uh, would face. 
blue welfareism, low inflation, you think the political model is, I mean, I'm not, that's what, you know, sustains. Then I think even for sustaining go the pie in order to I mean, that part of the coherence, I don't know. But I think that, you know, uh, it, may not, it may not manifest itself in, you know, a concerted effort to kind of get growth going. Doing enough to take to keep the welfare thing. But whether it will work or not, and how long it will. So let me understand. you. It, uh, is the argument that that this new welfareism can be sustained without a significant upward accrual of, or say, significant increase in tax revenue? That's not the argument, right? No, I, I, I don't. As an economist, I feel it cannot be sustained. There's no question. There's, it can't be sustained because, as Raghu showed, the kind of you know debt levels are rising. But I mean, the point is that. You can sustain it for some period of time, especially if you can influence the narrative, uh, you know, if you can, uh, you know, do other kinds of things to keep it going. I think in the long run, it's not sustainable. But I think, you know, how long is the long run, I, I just don't know. One uh, election cycle or two election, two election cycles can work, you say. Exactly, yeah. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. It's, you can't One election cycle, it has worked already. <laughs> exactly. That's A why second also, it can work exactly. without without tax revenues going, revenues going up significantly. Exactly. You know, because you, you can do, uh, you know, the, the off-balance sheet stuff. You know, you ha have the narrative that, you know, India is booming and the poor are getting a thing. So, uh, certainly, you know, one cycle, yes, but but in the long run, it's not sustainable. And I think that that, that is. Do we have that? Uh, do the uh, you know people have that coherence? Let's see. We'll wait and see. Other questions? Andrew, Andrew Foster. This would also explain why IT boomed. Yeah, yeah, it was a new yeah, sector. Yeah, Well, I mean, there there's some um, something uh, to what you're saying, which is, for example, land reform, uh, uh, making it easier to map land, digitize it, but also acquire it, uh, which would be beneficial to all concerned, but has the uh, the worry that the poor will be exploited by the developer, and and as a result, uh, there will be problems. So we have to have protections, absolutely. But we don't have to have an act which makes it virtually impossible to acquire land, which is what we've got now. So the government, uh, the Modi government, again, to its credit, early on tried to reform or, or was talking about reforming the Land Acquisition Act. And then it was accused of being suit boot ki sarkar, the uh, government of people who are suited and booted, and it backed off. Now, that's an example uh, of a place where the... Uh, sort of uh, the political ramifications. So uh, while social security is a third rail here, land acquisition is a third rail in India because it's very easy for people to protest. Uh, not just that the land was sold at a price, but they didn't get the absolute highest price that could possibly be obtained, uh, taking into account. So there are ways of dealing with this. For example, sharing the land revenues down the line, uh, developing land and giving people back a piece of the developed land. I mean, there are ways of doing it. But we haven't approached those. And 
if we don't get land acquisition right, we're not going to get the infrastructure built. And of course, a, many stalled projects are stalled because they haven't got the land, including, as I understand, the government's signature project, the Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail, is being held up because land acquisition is being difficult. So the, the point here is you need to invest political capital here. But that means you have to have a sense of how it all fits together. And that goes back to my complaint. What is the overall vision of how it fits together? What are the key points on which you've got to spend capital? Because we're spending capital, but maybe not in the right place. I think very a fair point. I think that uh, most of the things that you see are kind of de novo rather than, you know. Uh, but we know that taking away entitlements everywhere is difficult. But the one exception is the GST reform because it's come, you know, it's kind of had to revamp the existing tax administration at the sector and the states. And there was a lot of pushback uh, uh, against that. So, so broadly, I think your, your point is right. See, I think, uh, Raghu's, let, let me give you one other example why, uh, you know, I feel I'm less uh, competent to make these judgments about, you know, vision and coherence. I think broad point is well taken. Let me give you one example, um, two examples. Agriculture, you know, the lack of policy stability, big problem, right? And I, in my time, I've seen, been to, through three cycles of onion prices going up, uh, export taxes coming down, tariffs when it comes down. And you say, I mean, this hurts farmers. I mean, your uncertainty. But if your political model is that I, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice farmers because I care about, you know, price inflation for the middle class. It's not such a, a crazy thing to do politically. Similarly, I think, Raghu, one thing I thought I no, wanted... No, no, but, but, but Arvind, mm. you can't at the same time intervene wherever you want, whenever you want, and at the same time say, I want to improve the ease of doing business, I want to make... The, I mean, I, I understand there are some trade-offs you make, but if you are, in a sense, uh, impulsive, or not impulsive, but, but you don't have a process by which you change tariffs, by which you change exports, imports, by which you, then you're not incentivizing the other effect. All I'm saying is the, the things don't hang together. Yeah, but sorry, one, one last, just one. Uh, see, uh, the, the, uh, Raghu referred to the corporate tax reform. It's come out of the blue recently. It's a major corporate tax reform, and partly driven by the fact that the backs are against the wall. So it was like a, like a kind of, we have to do something to... So, so I think this was an idea that was actually actively considered four or five years ago and, and rejected. I don't want to go into all the personal angles here. But looking back, I realize that the taunt of suit boot ki sarkar that the government was vulnerable to also made it... Uh, uh, difficult to undertake the corporate tax reform. It's this new welfareism that burnishes the, you know, pro-poor credentials that then you acquire political capital to do the more difficult reforms like the corporate tax reform. So I, I'm not saying that, you know, so I'm saying it's not all, there is kind of some deeper kind of thing going on here, which we just can't dismiss so easily. And, and that the corporate tax reform is an example of that. Um, we are coming to the close of uh, uh, to the end of this meeting.